Uh, we are in Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, verses 31 and 32. As you have twice before, give your attention to the reading of God's word. It was said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you, that whoever divorces his wife, except for marital unfaithfulness, causes her to commit adultery. And whoever marries her who is divorced commits adultery. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Friends, God's goals for marriage are holiness and then happiness. And I call you today to treat marriage accordingly. Some of you here today are single. Against your greatest protests and greatest prayers, you're single. Some of you are looking. Some of you are engaged. Some of you are newlyweds. Some of you are oldlyweds. Some of you might be struggling in this relationship of marriage. And I remind every single one of you that God's goals for marriage are holiness and then happiness. And so we ought to treat marriage accordingly. Remember, in this section of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, he is reorienting us. He is taking the external teaching that's been falling on the outer ear, perhaps for weeks, months, years, generations, and he is pulling it through our ears, down into our hearts, and he is reorienting us toward holiness. He's pulling us back from the brink that says, what can I get away with? How far can I go? And, and like in the old cartoons where the bigger character would, would take the one that's running away and just pick them up and turn them around and set them back down, and now they're running back toward the larger character. He picks us up, he turns us around, he sets us down and causes us rather than running towards what is the limit here, we're running toward the heart of holiness, which ultimately is the heart of happiness in this life. Whatever your relationship is to marriage, it's a future relationship, it's a present reality, it's been part of your life for a long time, we're called to improve that second love by our first love. To improve the marriage with our spouse, even if it's one that we are just yet expecting someday, we are to improve that by pursuing our first love, which is Jesus Christ. And this begins to get at the heart of what Christ is saying to us in these two verses. If we're going to do this first, we must understand the fullness of biblical teaching on the subject. The subject of marriage and 
divorce. We have to understand that God's word speaks to this in a full way. As Jay Adams used to say that the church suffers from placosis. We take our favorite verse and we hang it on the wall and, and we focus on that verse and he always desired to make contextual wallpaper that would hang on the wall uh, that would give the context of that verse. We need the full scriptural teaching on any given subject. This is called systematic theology. There are some who, who would like to think that the only verse in scripture dealing with divorce is Malachi 2.16, and they say, God hates divorce. He hates it. And therefore, we should hate it and never allow it. Should never allow it because God hates it. But unfortunately for them, that is not the only verse in Scripture dealing with divorce. And the application of that truth of how God hates divorce for those who are hearing it was how they were dealing with one another. He doesn't say, so don't get divorced. He says, so don't deal treacherously with one another. And ultimately, as we read the Old Testament, we come to understand that God divorced faithless Israel. As they were unfaithful, he wrote them a certificate of divorce. We have Leviticus 24, which is where Jesus is pointing when he says, it is said. When Jesus says, it is said, we must always consider, well, where was that said and, and who was saying it? And so we turn to Leviticus uh, 24. That is not it. Deuteronomy 24, thank you. It's part of why God gave us a plurality of elders to call out the right scripture reference in the middle of the sermon. Deuteronomy 24. When a man takes a wife and marries her, and it happens that she finds no favor in his eyes because she he has found some indecency in her, then let him write her a bill of divorce and put it in her hand and send her out of his house. When she departs out of his house, she may go and be another man's wife. If the second husband rejects her and writes her a bill of divorce and puts it in her hand and sends her out of his house, or if the second husband who took her to be his wife dies, her first husband who sent her away may not take her again to be his wife. Since she is defiled, for that is abomination before the Lord. And you must not bring sin on the land, which the Lord your God is giving you for an inheritance. So it's not just Malachi 2. It's Deuteronomy 24 as well. And this is where the two pharisaical schools of thought that Jesus is dealing with in his day grow up out of Deuteronomy 24. And uh, some would say, uh, if, if a man finds any uncleanness, and so they turn that any into the burning of the morning toast, or, or whatever frustrated or annoyed the man, he could write a certificate of divorce for his wife, send her on his way, and be done with her. And so they had, they had made the issue of divorce so broad that it had become meaningless. It was really whatever fancied the man. And then there were some who didn't say any uncleanness. They would say any uncleanness. And so they, they hyper-focused on the word uncleanness and made it so narrow that it was virtually impossible for there to be justice on the issue in the application of God's word. And these were the two schools that are uh, the, the, the two schools of thought that are swirling about in Jesus' day as he confronts this. And so we have Malachi 2, we have Deuteronomy 24, we also have Leviticus 24, but that has nothing to do with the topic. 
Uh, but you can look at that later and see what you might glean from it. We have Matthew 5, where we are. We also have Matthew 19, uh, where, where Jesus points them to this, this beautiful picture of Genesis 2, another text that we need in understanding marriage, where Jesus explains to them how it had been from the beginning that it was not so. And so we come to understand that the law regulated divorce, but that does not mean that it was somehow proactively approving of divorce. This is what is meant when it's talked about, about uh, within the Mosaic administration, there was uh, these certificates of divorce that were given because of the hardness of hearts. This was something that God's people were doing, and God chose to regulate it so that Lord willing, it wouldn't just continue to consume the nation like a raging fire. But here in Matthew 19, we find Jesus pointing back to Genesis 2, to the beautiful foundational picture of what marriage ought to be. The one man and one woman in union together for life until death does them part. And then we have 1 Corinthians 7, where Paul gives this idea that, that if two people are married and the unbelieving spouse leaves and wants to leave, that it is okay for the believing spouse to let them leave. The issue of desertion, deserting the marriage. And so we see that that there is a whole complex of scripture that speaks to this issue. And as Presbyterians, part of our understanding of the fullness of teaching uh, of scripture is understanding that in our confession, we believe that we find a summary of the fullness of scriptural teaching on the issue. And on this issue of divorce, we find uh, this in, in the confession in chapter 24. And we read this paragraph, although the corruption of man be such as it is apt to study arguments unduly to put asunder those whom God hath joined together in marriage, yet nothing but adultery or such willful desertion as can no way be remedied by the church or the civil magistrate is cause sufficient of dissolving the bond of marriage, wherein a public an orderly course of proceeding is to be observed, and the persons concerned in it not left to their own wills and discretion in their own case. And so we find, we find teaching, we find admonition for how these things ought to be handled. And, and, and we're to remind ourselves that, that in the one Pharisaical school, they were the ones who were really studying uh, these arguments for why divorce could happen. As they were taking the principle and they were so generalizing it that it was left merely up to the will of man. We, we ought not to flip to the other side where it is so impossible that no justice can be done. No justice can be had for those who are the innocent party in a divorce. So we need to understand the fullness of biblical teaching on the subject. Second, we need to understand Christ's emphasis in this context of teaching on this topic. Remember, Matthew 5 is only one of the numerous texts that we find dealing with the issue of divorce. Sorry, just looking out, a reminder, cicadas cannot hurt you. Okay, so uh, careful out there, but they cannot hurt you. We need to understand Christ's emphasis in this context of teaching on this topic. There's a certain amount of hyperbole that Christ has been giving us in this section. A hyperbole that leads to an impossible situation for the hearers of Christ and the Sermon on the Mount. Just think of the section just above that we dealt with a couple weeks ago. 
How many of you, when you're on a road trip and your children are touching each other in the back seat, or in our car growing up, it wasn't even touching each other. It was crossing the invisible line. <laughs> and I'm still bitter to my brother because I realized as a little guy, I was naive, and when he'd look at me and go, I've already crossed the line 15 times, that he was lying to me. I'd been sitting there watching him. I thought, there's no way. How does And I would get so frustrated. But it's not even touching, but they're jabbing, they're poking. They're, get away, you get away, you're in my space. And you're, in, you're driving, it's not your space. I paid for that space, you know. But listen, if you don't stop this, I'm going to pull over and I'm going to chop your hand off because that's what Jesus told us to do. No, any, anybody ever said that? Threaten that? I mean, you might have threatened applying the, the Board of Education to their seat of learning. But you probably never looked at that verse and said, I need to chop off my children's hands because their hands are helping them to sin. It's in Jesus' teaching on that that we understand it's not my hand that causes me to sin. It's my heart. And what needs cut off are all the buffets of this world that feed my hunger for sin. That's what needs cut off. And it's better to lose out on whatever temporary pleasures there might be in that than to go to hell because I will not give up my sin for my Savior. So there's a, a certain hyperbole that Jesus is enacting in his teaching that is meant to instigate a certain recoil from what he says and then a certain repentance because of what he says. We're meant to draw back. And Lord willing, in drawing back, then turning and walking in the right direction. And that is what he is doing in verses 31 and 32. He's dealing with the legitimacy of the divorce, not divorce as a broad topic. That if you divorce your wife for just some willy-nilly breakfast wasn't good reason, you're causing her to commit adultery. And whoever marries her afterwards. See, part of a legitimate divorce is that the innocent party is free to remarry. And so Jesus is, in a, in a hyperbolic way, drawing that back. And he's, and he's telling them exactly what they are doing by their sin. By not taking marriage seriously, they are enacting more sin. Remember, sin begets sin. And not always sin just in our own lives. It enacts sin in the, in the lives of others as well. We are to take marriage seriously. And this reminder that Jesus inserts of here of reasonable divorce keeps our second love from taking the place of our first love. It reminds us that there's a greater relationship a greater purpose, a greater desire for us, and that is holiness unto the Lord. If we allow happiness to become the first goal of marriage and holiness to come along whenever, afterward, that's never good. And it leads to illegitimate divorce and complicating problems after that. See, we find a right response in Matthew 19. When Jesus is done teaching there and bringing in Genesis 2, uh, these Pharisees who came to trap him said, whoa, 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 uh, hey, listen, listen. If you're going to take marriage so seriously, it's almost like we probably shouldn't get married. Bingo. That is a right answer. If you're going to be not serious about marriage, don't get married. If you're not going to take it as seriously as the Lord takes it, don't take the vows. Don't put on the ring.
Here, Jesus gives this reminder of reasonable divorce. Porneia, in the modern English version, translates it marital unfaithfulness. And it's unqualified here. So it doesn't mean necessarily exclusively sexually, sexual adultery. It can mean that, but it doesn't necessarily mean that when it's not qualified, as is the case here. So what does it mean? Come on, Joel, give us the flow chart. We want to know exactly what we can get away with. That, that's what these folks were aiming at all the time. How far is too far? Where is the line? What can I get away with? But in asking, what does this mean? We start to get at the answer that Christ wants us to have to that question. What does marital unfaithfulness mean? And we begin to understand that we should not let anything reverse those marital goals of holiness, then happiness, or we will wander off into unfaithfulness and eventually see our marriage destroyed for no good or valid reason. So thirdly, direct your marital energy Christward. Direct your marital energy Christward. Perhaps you're single or engaged and you want to be a husband someday, young men. Or ladies, you want to be a wife someday. And you lie in your bed at night thinking, if only... I had someone to love me the way I want to be loved. Then I would be happy. Worry about being a holy husband. A holy wife. Desire that and direct your energy toward being Godly. Don't worry about finding the right one. Worry, worry about being the right one so that when your right one comes along, you are ready. And how do we do this? How do we direct our energies Christward? This, this is brought to fruition in your participation in the means of grace. Listening to the word read, reading the word yourself, listening to it preached, being baptized, sitting at the Lord's table where time after time you are reminded of the need of Christ's sacrifice. Each time you see one baptized, you're reminded, I was born into sin and death and I need converted I need a new heart. And each time we sit at the Lord's table being reminded, I need to repent of my sins. I need to be pursuing holiness in my life. And then prayer. Prayer as well, as we spoke of last week. Pouring our hearts out to God. And finding ourselves being sanctified in the midst of doing so. You participate in the means of grace so that you're ready when the right one comes along, because the right one is a righteous one. That's what you desire and, and should long for. And will your thoughts and your words and your deeds be the kind of thoughts, words, and deeds that will attract someone who desires to be with someone with righteous thoughts, words, and deeds? Time after time, in marriage counseling, find a man and a woman and there's a reason why they're in marriage counseling. It's because things aren't going well. Few people say, you know, things are going so well. Let's go get some marriage counseling to see how we can improve it, make it even better. No, I so often get, hey, we're on our way to the courthouse to file divorce papers, but we thought we'd swing by the church and see if you can do anything. 
And time after time, I tell husbands and wives, you know, there was a time, whether it was sitting, holding hands in Sunday school, or five shots of tequila in at some bar somewhere, you looked at each other and you thought, you're the one for me. And by that, you were meaning, I have some idealized version in my head of what it will be like to be married to you. The one who will have the, the perpetually perfect pompadour and the heavenly inhibited halitosis. You will always look good. You will always smell good. You will always treat me good. It will be wonderful to be with you. That's what you have in mind when you look at one another and you say, you're the one for me. But then you wake up, and it's usually the morning after the wedding. And you say, what have I done? You do not have a perpetually perfect pompadour. And you most certainly don't have heavenly inhibited halitosis. What have I done? And it's then that we're able to zoom out and see it from God's perspective, where God says, oh, this sinner over here and this sinner over here, I made them for each other. And there is something about how each of you sin that is meant to provoke righteousness and holiness in the other. We think, but my spouse, it's, their, it's them. They're the, they're the problem. They are so selfish. They only want things their way. So often in saying that, we realize, oh, wait. I'm kind of describing myself, too. Because I'm mad about them being selfish and wanting things their way because... I'm much more comfortable in being selfish and having everything my way. This sinner and this sinner, I have made them for each other. And 24-7, 365 days a year, if you're blessed to make it to 50 years of marriage, that means 18,250 days you have woken up as a married couple with the opportunity to pursue Christ, to pursue holiness, and then happiness. And all the reminders along the way that when you get those priorities reversed and you pursue happiness first, that you wander off into unfaithfulness and it can destroy your marriage. So fourthly, Develop your second love through pursuing your first love. Grow your love of your spouse through loving your Savior. Again, maybe you're single, maybe you're looking, maybe you're engaged, maybe you're newly married, maybe you're in a great marriage. Maybe you are in a struggling marriage and you think, how do I fix, how do I get, how do I improve my love for my spouse? If you make love for your spouse the thing, the first thing, that idolatry will kill your marriage. But if you make love for Christ the first thing, your love for your spouse will grow as well. And again, pursuing this through the means of grace. And if you're struggling to love your spouse, you already love them, you want to love them more, begin to see them as Christ sees them. Stop expecting them to be perfect and understand that they are a sinner too like you. Stop living in that disappointment that your spouse sinned. Serve them with the love of Christ. 
If you wait for them to be perfect before you serve them, you will never serve them. That, that's like waiting to get married when you can afford it. Or waiting to have kids when you have the money. There's not enough money in the world. If you wait to love and serve your spouse till they're living exactly the way they should, think how big of a problem it is if they're doing the same thing. See them as Christ sees them. Serve them with the love of Christ. Share with them the fruits of the Spirit that God is working in your heart and life. You might say, treat your spouse the way you, pe- you, the way you treat people outside the marriage. Have you ever been in one of those moments where you're at each other's throats and you know, the tensions are high? You're struggling with something. You're really frustrated. And the phone rings. And, Hi. Hey, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep, uh, yeah, we're ready. Yeah, this is wonderful. Yeah. Hang up the phone. Right back. You claim to love this person way more than you love the person that you just talked to on the phone. And you can be gracious with them. You can be kind to them. You can be generous with them. Begin to see, begin to serve, begin to share with your spouse as Christ would. Pursue that holiness, then happiness. Fifthly and finally, pray for troubled marriages. Pray for troubled marriages and pray for tired marriages. Elders. You know, sadly, in a lot of churches, if your marriage is in trouble, they say, here's the phone number of somebody outside the church. They'll help you. Come back and see us when you got it fixed. In other churches, marriages are in trouble. And the elders say, Pastor, we're behind you, way behind you. Go, help them. Friends, I can tell you, you can be thankful for elders here at Trinity who will walk through the valley of the shadow of death of a marriage with you, who are way more interested at times in helping you solve your problems than you might be in the midst of the struggle and the sin. You might say, oh, pray for troubled marriages. Are are there troubled marriages out there? Well, pray for troubled marriages because, one, they exist. Two, they exist here. And three, pray for them because you could be next. If your heart of sin chooses to take over and start pursuing happiness before holiness, you could be next. So pray. Pray for those who are in the, in the thick of the battle. Pray for those who've gotten the, the right priorities in the wrong order. Pray for those who are struggling, who are tempted to give up. And, and brothers and sisters, listen to me. If that is you, if you are struggling to hold on in your marriage, if you've been formulating the exit strategy, if you've been checking the exits as you drive by and think, one of these exits is going to have what I want and I am out of here. If that is you, come talk to me today. And let's get on this and let's work this and let's fix this. If you are engaged to be married and you are somehow thinking that this marriage is going to make me happy, come talk to me today and I will help you get your head on straight that the primary purpose of marriage is holiness and then happiness. Because your marriage will be very short-lived otherwise. And if you are single... Spend time on your knees praying for your friends who are married, praying for your Lord willing future spouse, 
praying for yourself that you would be walking in holiness, that you would be faithful in the means of grace so that when the right one, who's a righteous one, comes along, you will be ready. You will be ready for that righteous relationship. Marriages are in trouble, and they're not to be left to their own wills or desires in their own case. And again, this brings us back to why you need to pray for your elders. Because guess where that falls? Guess where that wisdom falls? That counsel falls? That encouragement falls? It falls on our shoulders. And we need the energy and the desire and the passion to walk with and and uphold and pray for and counsel those marriages that struggle. And why is this so important? Why do we need to pursue holiness, then happiness, so that we don't wander off into unfaithfulness and needlessly end a marriage and thereby create more sin in the lives of the people around us because all of this is rooted in and springs from the biblical truth that we are the bride of Christ. And we are being sanctified and we are being made holy for that great wedding day, the wedding feast of the Lamb. And so our priority as God's people is holiness. Not so that you can have your best marriage now, but because you're going to have your best marriage then. When we are face to face with Christ, our Savior, and our husband. Brothers and sisters, God's goals for marriage are holiness and then happiness. Treat marriage accordingly. Do not wander off into unfaithfulness and destroy your marriage and create multiplying sin in your life and the life of others. Stand with me as we pray. Our gracious God, our Heavenly Father, how glorious that you have not just called us to holiness, but you have enacted all of the means that we might be made holy. And that we might become the glorious, beautiful, no spot, no wrinkle bride of Jesus Christ for that last great day. Help us, Lord, to treat marriage with the intense care that you do. That intense care that helps hold marriages together. That at times, for the sake of the innocent, says this marriage must end. But Lord, help us to treat it as you treat it. That even if that be the case, that we would hate divorce that we would love and grow in and pursue marital faithfulness in all its forms and help us to pray for those who are struggling. Help us to uphold them in prayer but also in friendship, in wise and godly counsel and nudging them toward the holiness that is theirs in Christ Jesus, that their marriage is provoking them to. We ask these things in Jesus' name. And church, let us pray together. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.